everyone there is still people arriving so I will let them all in rapidly and we'll start with a, a little bit of an introduction from me um, I'm not going to talk forever uh, I will just um, introduce you to this series of events this is um, the second in our series of online poetry events the first one was Poetry and Science with Sue Dimmock and Chris Jones and you can see that on our YouTube channel if you missed it you will also be able to see this one on our YouTube channel later once I've um, downloaded it and edited it um, if you miss any of it. Uh, this week is Independent Bookshop Week. Um, can I ask everyone to make sure they're muted please? Thank you. Um, because otherwise uh, people appear on the screen. <laughs> um, yeah, so this week is Independent Bookshop Week and uh, we're putting on three online events for this week. So I'm sorry, Margaret, you appear to be in the middle of my screen. So you're going to appear in the video. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. So the first, this is the first of the events. Um, it's poetry with Matthew Walton and Rory Waterman, who've both published recently published um, books with Carcanet, and hopefully they're going to read from those, and then we'll have some questions and answers afterwards. Um, if you if you want to ask any questions. Um, just pop them in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it and then pass them on. Uh, please don't unmute yourself because we'll get all sorts of problems with feedback and uh, other issues like that, which you've probably seen on um, other Zoom events. Uh, our second event is tomorrow, which is the first in our series of author interviews. They're half hour author interviews with local writers and five leaves writers and anyone who wants to come and talk to us basically. Uh, the first one is with Darren Simpson. That will be at seven o'clock and it will be released on YouTube. Um, the third event for Independent Book Week is a collaboration with Nottingham UNESCO City of Literature and it features um, people from the Women's Prize for Fiction. So we've got Anne Patchett and Tari Jones uh, who will both be uh, talking about their work um we have a special offer to go with that uh we also have a special offer to go with this which i'll tell you about at the end um what else oh ross is going to talk to us on friday so i'll be putting up an interview with ross on friday evening um sort of telling us all about how five leaves is doing i'm going to stop talking now please don't forget to use the chat function to ask any questions as we go um Rory's going, to, Rory's going to read for 10 minutes, then Matt's going to read for 10 minutes, and then um, we'll have a short Q&A session, so the event shouldn't be too long. Um, but yeah, so I think without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Rory. Um, I will unmute him. You've unmuted me. Hello. Thank you. So thanks, Pippa. Thanks, everyone. At five leaves um how do i do this share there we go so i'm sharing my screen okay yeah so thanks pippa thanks everyone at what might be the world's favorite bookshop it's in it is in my world anyway um and thank you everyone for for logging on um i'm going to read poems from my my third collection just from this from sweet nothings um which was published about a month ago um, we're only reading for 10 minutes each, so I'm going to go straight into reading poems about two things that I know are dear to the hearts of every customer of Five Leaves, um, football and corporate middle management, and then I'll end with a couple of other things. I'm just going to share the view differently. Single page, there we go. Alfreton Town, nil, Brackley Town, one, 89 minutes, for Lloyd Pettiford and Adam Tocock. The pitch is white where the sun's not been seen on its hill-cresting flight. 
The tea queue is long and shrouded in breath as men in fat coats grunt at each other, though the game's going on. But I'm on the terrace with 64 others where a bloke in a tank top and built like a tank turns to the dugouts and breaks the near silence. Change it up, Billy boy! We're fucking wank! Then he faces the game again, squinting upfield as one of their wingers slaps a long cross out for a throw-in. Come on, lads! He bellows, rub-rubbing his hands. So this loss is his loss, but also his triumph. He boos at the whistle, says see ya to others and runs for a piss and doesn't drive home, cross a ground off his list and no, he's on. No, he lives for this. Losers, winners. A small boy clambering up stadium steps for the very first time, gripping his father's hand, gawping at that hallowed stretch of turf beneath him and without being able to do a thing about it, falling in love, Sir Bobby Robson. So, up those steps and out to scrambled senses, Sabutio men on bays, surrounded by heads and hoardings, spurts of smoke, occasional hollers. It's all so far away, all takes so long. You've just turned seven, you know most of the rules and never can wear that Liverpool shirt again, though Nan scrimped for it two long months ago. No, now you're in the south stand, Carrow Road. Ray Houghton's been upended by Ian Crook, and you are jeering because the others are jeering, and hugging your father's suddenly fatherly arm, and waving the new inflatable canary you'll later clothe, then pierce, and finally lose. You lost. But now you're Norwich, so Dad is too. You'll take the jokes and jibes for him at school from glory hunters in Arsenal and Liverpool shirts while he's at home 500 miles from you. And now he's purblind and ransacked by 30 more years of self-made battles. Black-eyed women eating and blackout drinking. Then all those bottomless days of pining for chances. The radiation skin like, sorry, that radiation scar, like chicken skin, is not his fault, nor the fear. But what of the new young wife who stopped being here, yet suddenly owns his house and all he had? You scowl when people said he got what was coming. And you're with his friends to tell your father the truth. Not your idea, the friends who's cooked a lunch. The three of you sit in cutlery squeaking silence, then two find the heart to try. And when it's no use, there's cheesecake and Norwich on the radio. That static as Timu Puki skips a defender and finds the net is 10,000 hymns and yous, applauding the way you couldn't those years ago. You watch his eyes. He sees the same things you do. So in my second collection, Sarajevo Roses, I invented an academic called Bob Pintle. Um, he works at Peterborough University, which doesn't exist, almost exists, but it doesn't actually exist. And, and he has uh, four poems, I think, in this, in this collection. And this is one of them, final years. For and about Dr. Bob Pintle, senior lecturer in professional creativity. Peterborough University. For years and years, Pintle blew annual dust off turgid lectures, was happy to earn his crust from gobbets he'd once committed to memory, but now the culture's changed. His new VC has various agendas, globalisation, foreign students, employability, and just for him, a new professionalisation of writing module, whatever the fuck that is. So he stands in front of the solemn three of seven who've made it in, his class starts at 11, and mocks up cover letters, draws up lists, talks up blind hopes. Of course they'll never climb the slippery pole rubbed dry for nepotists, nor learn the wits to avoid it. In 12 months' time he knows he'll write the Nietzsche teaching course reference. Harry's sometimes punctual and shows deference to blind authority, often reads enough to write his essays and other copy-paste guff after they've all grown bored with growing bored. 
What do I need to do to get a first? Glares Lara, a six eyes sharpen on his eyes in sudden wakefulness. He's not rehearsed a valid and honest answer, so he lies, then circles the word career aims on the board and starts a mind map. It grows a couple of arms. Uni tutor, I'd like to do what you do. Writer, to use my degree. A car alarm moans through the glass, somewhere out of view, off campus. He lets them go. It's 22. And I just say that someone who's logged in tonight, a former student of mine, um, who I like very much, um, is Harry and messaged me the other day to say that he thought that was about him, but it isn't. Um, uh, but apologies, not apologies. Garlic. Oh, yeah, when I was about, um, I don't know, when I was a teenager, I used to play tennis all the time on some knackered former RAF tennis courts in Lincolnshire at the back end of the village of Nocton. Um, Garlic, one, Wimbledon men's final, 1994. His winners were yours, the future flung off, flung off, flung off, like the lines of rain from your balding Slazenger ball when it clipped each puddle you'd airbrushed from your mind. Yes, you were nothing town Lincolnshire's swarthy yank, every diamond hole in the fence and imagined face where this court gave over to weeds here and there, until the asphalt is ruts, and runnels of weed. And that's when you return, no scuffed racket over your shoulder and no one to plonk back your sliced backhands. It's been, what, 20 years since you were last here with nothing to show but the bluster you'd never felt? One dead net post remains, its crank handle jammed with rust, the fattened threads shining freshly after you butt it with a palm. You can name the bindweed now, but don't have to live with it. What else to do but know you needn't have come, that it might repeat on you, like garlic. Two, it might repeat on you. Garlic, she play screams, and Christ, it's been almost a year since she'd never known it. And now she wants pesto to dribble on pizzas, the frontiers woman pleasure of knowing we made this as it turns to rot in a back of shelf kiln jar this winter. She's already ripping the waxy green ears from their stems, feeding them into a bag, playing gleaner. But she has made you the gleaner, hasn't she? This warmth comes and goes like a nuzzly cat. You bend over and detach a buoyant flower head and nibble off budding flowers like they're red currants. A woodpecker's nutting his way home in salvo somewhere, and when she asks what it is, you mustn't laugh. She's irritated now, back palming a hip. Staring across this edible lawn, why aren't you helping? So you start, swift to teach clump, gladly nudged back to the instant as she knows to see it, in this acre of woodpecker echoes, making a job where he has his. And I'm just going to read one more. <clears throat> Nottingham Nocturne. Oh, this is definitely a poem set in the time before. Maybe the time ahead, who knows? Probably. Nottingham Nocturne. Another Friday night. A mile or so away, a boy will be watching chunks of kebab dribble mouth to paving down a pissy alley. He doesn't know we've all been him, and it wouldn't help. Some are working night shifts, some are alone, always more are cocooned indoors, at least until daybreak. And you are restless beside rest, beside recharging, remoulding desires as the sycamore heaves in the lamplight. Do not pretend you have done all you could for anyone. And try not to breathe too loud. And listen as she snores rabbit snores against you and rainbursts crackle on glass. Never stop listening. Except for you can stop listening, at least to me. Thank you. I'm hopefully not muted now. Thank you ever so much. That was really lovely. Um, definitely time before or time after. Um, possibly with a bit of the time now in the, in the meantime. Um, yeah, really enjoyed that. Um, and now I think with further ado, if Matt's ready, I think we'll hand over to Matt to uh, 
give us his reading. Um, hi, um, thanks very much for having me. It's a joy to be reading for um, Five Leaves tonight. I'm going to be reading from um, my new book, um, Squid Squad, a novel which is as much a book of poems as it is a novel. And I suppose what I'm trying to do here is to um, muck around a little bit with the distinction between the two forms. So the first couple of things I'm going to read are um, from this um, title, poem or, or novel or poem novel um, called Squid Squad. And then I'll go on to um, some shorter things later on. Um, so Squid Squad, number three. During the power cut, Natalie Chatterley doesn't budge from behind the drum kit. Neris Harris spits out her whiskey. Bubblegum loosens Hank Strunk's teeth. Daylight deepens like a familiar dilemma, murmurs Neris Harris as she cycles beneath the footbridge. Kite strings tangle in the telegraph wires. Angus Mingus's mattress sags. Where the indistinctions between things are at their most explicit, ponders Dustin Mostyn over the mushroom cannelloni. The indistinctions between indistinctions may be at their most obscure. Bradley Ridley lobs pebbles at the library windows. Squirrels squabble. The rhododendron rots. Audrey Chowdhury's dictionary goes missing. Ruth Reith splits her lip on the elevated door. Number 20. Audrey Chowdhury draws around her left hand, then sharpens her pencil and draws around her right. Neris Harris's cider sours. As it bounces, Bradley Ridley's wet tennis ball leaves its outline across the pavement. Natalie Chatterley muffles her timpani drums. The moths get lost in the rigorous mist. Sassiness softens like sandpaper, says Ruth Reith, and stretches out on the bench. Hank Strunk mimes the action of unpeeling a banana. Thistles rustle in the fitful wind. Our conversations convey little besides the conventions of conversation Lola Wheeler supposes out loud. Ruth Reith walks out of the walk-in refrigerator. Angus Mingus shivers in his towel. Nuthatch's nest in Neris Harris's bike basket. Lola Wheeler skulks home in her socks. Um, and I'm going to move on to um, one of um, a series of poems that I've got in the book um, that take the form of um, of grading schemes um, and there are three of them um, the one I'm going to read tonight is called Green Gauge and um, I'm going to dedicate this one um, to a writer called Rachel Smart who is a, a former student of ours at the University of Nottingham and um, this poem's got a mention of ping pong tables in it. And Rachel's published a piece today called, um, with the letters page, which is, many of you know the letters page, it's the um, journal that's um, run from the University of Nottingham um, Creative Writing Department and edited by my colleague, John McGregor. And um, uh, um, Rachel is um, an incredible writer in all kinds of ways um, and um, it's a joy to have seen this piece. Um, I implore everybody to go and have a look um, if you can find it after this event's finished. Um, it's perhaps the, the best, best written, most beautifully written, most um, insightful and creative thing I've read about um, COVID and our current moment um, and kind of blew me away when I read it this afternoon. So I've no idea if Rachel's um, watching this live or if she'll get to see the recording of it, but um, this is dedicated to her this evening, Green Gage. Grade, 86 to 100%. Descriptors, creatively green, insightfully green, illuminating, inspiring, exciting, authoritative. Exemplars, 
churchyard ivy, red wine bottles, card table bays, mature pike, Cavallo Nero. Grade, 70 to 85 percent. Descriptors, persuasively green, sophisticated and original in its greenness, ambitiously, meticulously, critically green, convincingly or unexpectedly green. Exemplars, pine woods in late summer, after rain, snooker table bays, wilted spinach, starboard navigation lights, the bruising around the black eye after two to three days. 60 to 69 percent, fluently and thoroughly green, precise, rigorous. The seaweed in Norfolk, the Lyle's golden syrup tin, white wine bottles, kale, the flex of the Christmas tree lights. 50 to 59, clearly, confidently, consistently green, accurately green, carefully, congruently, coherently green. Ping pong tables, the wicket at Trent Bridge, boiled green lentils, Bramley's, the wicked witch of the West. 40 to 49, satisfactorily and sufficiently green, adequate. The wicket at Edgebaston, Rose's lime marmalade, the incredible hulk, granny smiths, rock crabs, mushy peas. 35 to 39, incompletely, inadequately, inconsistently green, derivative or limited in its greenness, superficially green. Excuse me. Irrelevantly green. Broad beans, the wicket at Headingley, the green tinge of a blue bottle, dry moss, gardener's twine, 20 to 34, erroneously stroke wrongly green, extremely limited in its greenness, inappropriate, insufficiently or incoherently green, the grass after a short drought, budgery gauze feathers, boiled brown lentils, oxidised copper, the seaweed in Suffolk, zero to 19%, greenness absent or lacking, formless, detrimental to greenness, the grass where a tent has been, mint flavor durex, mold, the bruising around a black eye after four to five days, the vinegar in the jar after the pickles are finished. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna read a poem that some of you may have seen um, that a couple of people have very kindly been sharing online and although I wrote it um, quite a while ago the, 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 the book was obviously submitted um, you know a year and a half before publication um, a few people have, have commented that they found um, that this poem has, um, has found its moment in, in what we're all living through at the moment so here goes sonnet Monday a.m. Monday p.m. Tuesday a.m. Tuesday p.m. Wednesday a.m. Wednesday p.m. Thursday a.m. Thursday p.m. Friday a.m. Friday p.m. Saturday a.m. Saturday p.m. Sunday a.m. Sunday p.m. And um, I'll finish um, with a poem um, there's, there's a bunch of poems in the book that are, are written with other people in mind, sometimes other writers. And um, this is a poem that I wrote in response to an invitation to write something for the centenary a couple of years ago of the poet W.S. Graham. Um, and so this was originally included in an anthology of people commemorating Graham. And he's a poet whose work I've always loved. So, um, however, um, intangible the connection may be. This is, this is something that I wrote with his poems in mind. Which of us is it I am? How long could we live off peanuts and pickles? What about whiskey? Whose photographs that? What's the word for what it means to feel no doubt? You feel no doubt. Will you sell me your pencil? How deep is the mist? How would I know if you were taping our conversations? What's in the water? Who was in the hammock? Is the radio okay? Or is it just the signal? Why buy a ticket if you're not taking the train? 
What about the wasps? Did you wind your watch this morning? Is anybody going to finish this soup? What will we do if, with no movement from us, the shadows of our hands make gestures of their own? What's in the jam jar? Who sneakers are those? Didn't you send the postcards until you'd come home? Shouldn't we leave a note to say which road we'll be taking? Is the tape still running? Is this bridge on the map? Where did you learn to punch that hard? Where did you leave the suitcase? Could you sell me a stamp? Can nothing stop us thinking? Nothing can stop us thinking. What good's a good voice if your tunes are bad? What if the camera jams? Isn't there more vinegar? Which were the pages you ripped from the book? Isn't there another way out of the kitchen? Is whimsy worse than wordlessness? What's holding us back? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt and Rory. Those were absolutely amazing readings and uh, I can see a few uh, clapping reactions there. So uh, people are obviously, obviously enjoying your work. Um, Okay, we've, we've actually got a question. Uh, I think I'll start before I get on to the audience's questions by asking each of you in turn just briefly, what was the inspiration for your latest book? Um, if we start with uh, Matt while Rory unmutes himself. Um, thank you, what a great question. I think with this book, I've probably allowed myself to um, do a bunch of things that I've always kind of had it in mind to do and when I've attempted them before. So, I mean, it's, it's not um, in a conventional sense um, a novel, but, um, and it, but it's, it's a kind of poem hybrid novel. But I've always been interested in um, things like Trout Fishing in America by Richard Brotigan or the, particularly the short stories by Lydia Davis um, the, or... Um, the interrogative move by Paget Powell, but kind of play around with um, those ideas of form. So um, that's part of it. And so that's from a fiction side, from a poetry side. I always like um, poets who put a character um, in their work. So um, back to W.S. Graham, he's got a lot of poems with a character called Malcolm Mooney and Luke Kennard's collection Kane was a big influence, as was arguing with Malarkey by Carola Luther and Jack Self by Jake Polly. Um, and, and so I was kind of trying to do the fiction stuff that poets do and the maybe more poetic stuff that a lot, that a lot of fiction writers do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank I you. want to ask you loads and loads more, but <laughs> uh, we, have, we have more to get through. Rory, um, what inspired your latest collection? Well, I think I had lots, had lots of ideas for things that I sort of wanted to write about. Um, and then my life went crazy for about three years. So, well, a couple of years. So um, I ended up writing about that largely instead. And um, often not about that, but that was the, that was the framework. My first collection was, um, well, it was a bit of this, bit of, bit of that, like a lot of first collections are. They just sort of, um, you don't know you're writing a book and then suddenly you have done. And my second collection, I kind of moved away from, the concerns of my first and, and really thought quite a lot about um, other places, other people. Um, and, I, and, and um, yeah, then I had a very interesting year and a half or so and wrote a lot of poems. Um, so really uh, that, that, that's, that's what I'm moving away from that again now. Yeah. Some other stuff. So life basically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You could call yeah. it that. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Right. So we've got a question for Matt here from Amanda Bellamy. Squid Squad reminded me of Rear Window, moments of people's lives being observed. How influenced are you by film or art? Um, thanks, that's a really nice question. I would say with these poems quite a lot, but I'd never thought of, um, I never thought of Rear Window, but I was, I was part of a, a project of writing poems about Psycho a few years ago, um, which is another Hitchcock film, isn't it? They're both Hitchcock films, mm -hmm. aren't they? Um, the, the films that kind of influenced Squid Squad are um, the early short films by Hal Hartley, which are basically um, a lot of young people in New York. They're from like the early 90s, um, like Theory of Achievement 
and um, help me out somebody with, with another title of a uh, surviving desire and things like that. And, and a lot of them before he started making full length films are these sort of 15, 20 minute films and people speaking sort of in sort of pseudo philosophical um, mildly pompous um, ways while someone stands behind them playing the accordion and they're in a very cramped <laughs> flat. And the other sort of similar film was um, Slacker by Richard Linklater um, that has got lots of like, you, you, maybe you remember it, it's got lots of tiny moments and there's not a narrative as such, but the structure is really strong. There's a hundred um, episodes of, you know, a character will be doing something like writing on post-it notes and as they place a post-it note on the window, then the camera will pick up on something that's happening the other side of the window, like someone walking into a bar or something like that. So those, both in their sort of smallness and their kind of play with narrative structures that aren't narrative arcs were, were sort of big influences. Thank you, really nice question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, another question from Amanda Bellamy Ferrari. Um, how do you decide on how to structure each poem? So where the line breaks and or stanza breaks? Are? God, I don't know. Um, absolute sheer fucking brilliance. No, um, I, I, oh, I, I, I don't know. I've never consciously, I don't know. Have, have I never consciously thought about that? That's nonsense. I've written in um, uh, quite a lot of sort of received forms quite often. Um, I don't know how to answer that. I I'm afraid I don't really know how to answer that. Um, I, I, I fully believe in, you know, William Carlos Williams idea of a poem being a machine of words and, um, and the two have to have to work very harmoniously for it to come off. Um, but I don't know, there isn't sort of, you know, I don't input in anything into a program and, and out it pops or oh, I know that's not the question, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think it's that simple to answer really. Do you edit as you go? Or yeah, do, you, do um, you write and then re redraft? Yeah, I I um I heard someone else give a reading, uh, Lauren Terry, whose new pamphlet is out with uh, Leaf, mm. and she was saying that she writes a, bro a block of prose and then sort of chips away at Desenio, you know, the sculptures inside or something. Mm. But um, that's not me. Um, yeah, I edit continually as I'm going, but I I I, I, I certainly don't write a block of prose. Um, Yes, I edit, I edit constantly and I kind of worry away at something obsessively for, you know, it could be days and days, weeks, um, uh, a very long time. And, um, but sometimes, you know, I'll get an idea for a poem when I'm out on a walk or something, you know, doing something um, else, often when I'm meant to be with, with people and socialising and I'll end up just sort of obsessing over trying to get mm. lines right in a notebook or on my phone or something. Um, and then not write again for ages, you know. Yeah. So Amanda's clarified. She said um, she was thinking of Alfreton, Ta Alfreton Town. Oh, sorry. The break three quarters of the way through. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not Amanda's fault for the question. It's my fault for a terrible answer. I just don't really know how to answer no, it. With, with that poem. It's an interesting yes, answer. Um, uh, yes, uh, I suppose because that's where we go to the meditation, isn't it? The meditation, my boy. Um, he bellows, rub rubbing his hands. So this loss is his loss. So I suppose it's... Um, it's simply because that's the point at which the poem breaks to its uh, to its thought about what's above it. God, it's like when you explain a joke, you know, it just doesn't work, does it? Sorry, but that's that's what's going on. That's what's going on there. Um, yeah, um, it's Matt, a thought about what has happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry um, for the terrible answer. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's interesting. I'd like to talk about it for for ages. Um, so there's another question following on. If you edit continually, how do you know when you're finished? And that's a good question for both of you, actually. So, A poem is never finished, only abandoned, right? But um, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, well, you're quite right. Uh, th I'm not going to tell anyone what it is, but there's, uh, there's one word in one poem that I read tonight that I've subtly changed since the book came out, which irritates me a lot. And there were a couple in the last as well. There's nothing wrong with what was there, but I just thought of something better when it was too late. Um, so I guess you never finish, do you? I mean, you might, I, I never kind of quite give up on it. I wouldn't do an order and just kind of ruin all my poems or anything, but, um, uh, but what, yeah, what, I'm what, chipping away. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Matt? For me, it's curiosity. I think when the, when the curiosity goes out of a particular piece of writing, then I'll stop looking at it and go, you know, that's, that's everything I've got on it. So I've, I've picked everything there is on the bones um, and move on to the next thing. 
and it, and it's you know and it's curiosity that that often about a word or a or a sort of formal thing in some ways like like you know trying to think what's the middle ground between poems and novels or um you know like the 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 poem in the structure of the 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 grading scheme um it was the first thought i had was to do with with the color but um i was like well, I'm, I'm always interested in structures and structures that aren't i suppose in a kind of conceptual art way structures that aren't necessarily poetic structures but ones that you could borrow and i've, I've done that with you know things like um the alphabet and roger's thesaurus in the past so um the the grading scheme came to mind and i was like oh what could you do with that yeah that's uh i don't know that poets never cease to amaze me with where they get poetry from <laughs> and i love that i love that well, one because it's so yeah. surprising you know you'd never think of sort of making a grading scheme into a poem except you did and you did it <laughs> well, that, that's it and, and once yeah i mean like if you'd ask me if i would do it i would go oh yeah sounds interesting i'd never do that but once you've done it obviously everything in retrospect appears as if it was inevitable mm. yeah okay um i don't think we're going to go on much longer because uh, our extensive audience survey says people don't like sitting watching zoom for hours and hours on end but I think I'd like to finish with asking each of you a question which Madam iPad, who I believe is Letitia, <laughs> um, has asked uh, specifically to Rory, but um, would apply to both of you. Do you know what your next collection might be? Do you have a stash of work coalescing or do you work to a theme? So if we start with Rory. Yeah, well, well, I, I don't normally work to a theme at all. Um, I, I sort of can't do commissions, that sort of thing. Um, I tried once and had to give up and it would have given me 400 quid. So I really mean it. I can't do it. Um, but I, I, I did write, a, I think things might be a little bit different now um, because I, I have some poems from when I was sort of beginning to work on this book that are very different to anything in it. Um, uh, far more sort of externally focused. Um, and... The few poems I've written since this collection, there aren't many, uh, tend to focus around, um, I'm quite, I'm obsessed with borders, you know, the things that sort of the impositions people put between one another, um, you know, often the same people, the inner German border, the Korean border, those sorts of things. And um, I've been obsessing about that. And then an opportunity came up to apply for a, a, um, a, a, a residency in Bouchon in South Korea. And, um, I got that uh, based around that idea and that's something I'm very interested in doing writing about um about borders and impositions and and something in that context mm -hmm. that'll probably be a pamphlet um but a lot of the other poems I've written are about um very much not about me um I suppose they're about me but um but not really um focused on on those sorts of things not more similar maybe in a way to what I did in my second book but um but different again um I'm jabbering but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's how it will work out. Um, but I definitely want to do something very different next time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, what are you uh, working towards or working on or planning? I've got, I've got a lot of notes. Um, over the last couple of years, I've read a lot of Jory Graham and Karen Soley um, and a bit of um, Robert Haas in there as well. And um, who are writers whose never influ influence has never come out of my work before, but was very curious about the way that they use abstraction. And, and while I was reading their work, um, I made lots of notes um, that was all a little bit more um, genuinely philosophical than perhaps what the, the characters in Squid Squad go around asking. And um, I typed them up at the start of this year after I'd, submit, after I'd submitted the final version of, of Squid Squad and realized I had seven, seven, about 70 pages, but it was all thinky stuff and, and there was absolutely no imagery. So what I'm at work at, at the moment is trying to find images and sort of more um, tangible bits to go in those poems. But I feel, I feel I'm in a nice place that the, um, the, you know, the last book is, is only just out and I'm, I've got this fairly fertile ground that I'm going to be playing around with. So, um hopefully you'll see some of that in due course excellent 
I mean, thank you so much to both of you. It's fascinating to me how differently and similarly you both approach poetry. It's, it's really interesting. And I guess every poet approaches writing poetry very differently. Um, I will finish now by saying thank you so much to both of our poets. Um, they've done a sterling job despite my technical ineptitude and tendency to burble. Um, I absolutely loved the readings. Um, two things you need to know before you go, don't log off now. Um, all, our, all our online events are free. Um, but we're asking if you like it, please try and make a donation to Knott's Refugee Forum. Um, and secondly, we have a special offer for you. All of our online events, um, you will be able to buy any book by any of the featured writers for up to the end of the month after the event for 10% off. So either come into the shop when we open at, uh, on the 1st of July, which is really exciting. Um, or email um, bookshop at fiveleaves.co.uk if you want to take advantage of those offers. Um, and that's for any of our online events. And that, I believe, is it. So thanks again so much. I wish I, wish I could unmute everyone and let you all clap like mad because, I mean, watching the faces, everyone's just thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank Does you. Does anyone want to go down the pub? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying one of these days. <laughs> <laughs>